Good afternoon. A little bit of a glitch. Trying to get things going. So uh, please sign in. Remember to give me your homework today. Uh, I think that everybody received a copy of the crash report. If you didn't, just text me later today and I'll try to get you a, another copy. Uh, technology will always be a little bit of a challenge. The other thing too is that if at any point there's an echo, uh, please let me know um, in the YouTube comments that uh, you're getting an echo. I have no idea why some days the music isn't providing an echo and other days it is. So hopefully this mic is working correctly. So what I think I'm going to do for today is stick to highway driving and I really had wanted to include a small section on what to do with animals that come out when you're driving because we talked about yesterday about hitting a dog and being responsible and finding the owner calling the police uh, but we really didn't have a chance to uh, get into it uh, too much so we're gonna probably delve into that a little bit later at the very end of uh, today's uh, segment but today we're gonna focus on driving on the highway so you look out the window if you can because I've got windows all around me right now this week would have probably been for most of you um, your highway lesson usually by the fourth week of class we have gone through the different types of parking we've gone through four-way stops and yielding and lane changes and things like that I usually leave the highway drive for closer towards the end of our 10 hours I do like to go to the lead traffic circle, which we'll talk about today in class. We'll talk about the Portsmouth Circle. I do have a short video that the state provided us about the Lee Circle. And really, it's not a circle. It's really called a roundabout. And we're going to talk about what, what is the difference between a traffic circle and a roundabout. So we'll be talking about that. Um, and when the weather's nice getting up onto the highway, getting down to the Portsmouth Circle, driving around downtown Portsmouth. Sometimes we get to go around Newcastle, where we go over a metal graded bridge. Um, it's a good drive. I, I really like that lesson. Of all the different lessons that we have, that's the one that um, is pretty enjoyable. Um, once you learn to drive on a highway, uh, it's I think it's less stressful the hardest part is probably the merging on but uh, once you get on and maintain good position check your mirrors watch your speed I, as you know you've gone on vacation you're gonna go hours and hours and hours on a highway so the negative part which we'll talk about is how to stay alert how not to let highway fatigue get to us where we're not watching things as well as we should be watching and what can we do to um, avoid pitfalls on the highway so um, I'm gonna try to get into the PowerPoint I don't think that I had this all set up and it really created a problem there I am where is my PowerPoint See, that's the bad camera I try not to use that oh my Goodness, okay, I think I know what I'm going to do. Let's drop it right in. There we go. Yeah, I'll do it that way. Let me get the, our intro music. Okay, so get out some paper, something to write with. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, a basic understanding of highway driving. We know that the speeds on highway will vary depending on uh, lanes and states that you're driving in but for the most part we're going to take a look at what are the differences and what makes them alike and why are they so difficult what what is the 
a hard thing about driving on the highway. So I downloaded some pictures that I threw on these slides today. And after I threw this one on, <laughs> can anybody text me? I'm going to not answer it for a minute, but can someone text me and let me know what you see wrong in this picture? Okay, so once you see what's wrong, text me on my phone or text me on the YouTube channel here. And we'll see who, who's the first one to get it. But let's talk about what are the things that make them alike. Well, first of all, there are five terms for highway driving. Interstate, toll roads, thoroughways, turnpikes, and freeways. And I guess you could also lump it under a super highway. So super highways would be the main category. And then we'll have five subcategories. And then down at the very bottom, this is what makes them different. And then, no, they're not driving all the same way. Cones in the grass, that's interesting. I'll have to go back and take a look at that. It's European. Very good. There's the correct answer. They're driving on the opposite side of the road. So kudos to Seth. Okay. That's pretty cool. You guys picked that up. Um, so speed. The minimum speed you're going to probably find on a highway will be 45 miles per hour. And the highest, at least around here, will be 65 to 70 miles per hour. There are a few stretches that you can go 70 miles per hour. And then we're going to take a look a little bit further in today's talk about in some states, it's either it's e even going to be higher than 70 miles per hour. And then the last thing I want you to understand is that these roads are not always free. So make sure that you include in your notes what happens if I go onto one of these roads and they charge money and I don't have money. What's going to happen to me? All right, so we're going to talk about that. Now, the two main reasons for using highways. You get to go where you want to get to a lot sooner because of the high speeds, and then you probably have a better chance of getting there safely. So write that down. So when you go to plan out a trip, and you use GPS. One of the options that you're going to probably have is avoiding tolls and the quickest route that you can get to a place. So you will be able to put in some um, variables into how GPS is going to take you to where you want to go. So think about don't always choose your first route that they probably prompt you with, they're going to probably give you like an A, B, and C, or a 1, 2, or 3. Uh, take about a minute or two and think about where is this GPS or Google Maps taking me? Is this the way that I really want to go? Now, I think money should play a factor. Uh, also, time will play a factor. You're going to see that uh, some routes are going to cut off like 15, 20 minutes, depending on the, the length of of the road that you're traveling or the distance that you're traveling. So these are all things that you should really not just jump at your first reaction to how to get somewhere, but really think about what is the roadway that they're taking me on? Am I going to really be super stressed out on this particular roadway? Maybe I should take a roadway that's not used as often, doesn't cost me any uh, money to use it, and I'll be less stressed. So that's a, a thing that you should think about. Now, the problem with being on the highway is that you have to think quicker and react faster to the speeds. Now, I'm going to try to show a clip from Andy Pilgrim, who we saw earlier on in the driver's ed program, and I'm hoping that I'm not going to lose my spot. So let's see if this, this is on multitasking. Oh, I'm sure they'll be fine driving. The statistics actually show that students who do better in school are more likely to believe they can multitask, and sadly this belief is often applied to their driving. Research shows us that humans can do one thing about 100% well, and two tasks at 30 to 40% efficiency. Parents, please don't teach your children that attempting to multitask while driving is okay. It's plainly not.
Now, okay, now I think I'm going to have to keep an eye on the mic. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. That's helpful. Yeah, when I lose the, um, the green bar, then I'm losing my microphone. And these switches, when I switch from one slide to another slide, is where I'm getting into trouble. So hopefully you can see. So, um, or not see here. Let's try um, Andy again. Sadly, most people treat it as a right and not a privilege. And of course, this attitude can easily transfer to new drivers. Driving should be something we work on every day to improve our skills. I know adults who have been driving for 25 years and still don't know how to do something as simple as merging without negatively impacting traffic flow. There is no excuse for this. If you feel you are not a competent driver, then work at it. Go out and practice to get better. Remember, driving is different. It takes attention and skill to be a consistently safe driver. Okay, I apologize for the glitches. For some reason, they didn't set up my screen correctly when I loaded all the... I'm going to try to... I guess I'm just going to have to deal with it. Yeah, okay. Special features to the highway that I want you to write down. I will test you on this. I want you to know what controlled access, limited access means. That means that there are on-ramps and off-ramps. That's all that means. Why the state doesn't use one term, they use both, controlled access and limited access. They mean the same thing. You can only get on and off at certain locations. So with an on-ramp, we know that we're going to call merging where our lane is ending and it's blending in with another lane. When you get off a highway, it's an off-ramp or a deceleration lane that's going to take you off the highway and onto a, another main road. So an interchange is where you have an intersection of two highways and at different levels. Okay, so write that down. An interchange is above and below at different levels. And then the other term that I want you to write down is mile markers. North-south numbers go higher. No, north numbers go higher, south numbers go lower. But also remember, if you're going north, the opposite of north is south. And just like east is opposite of west. So when you head west, the numbers get lower. When you head east, they get higher. So all interstate numbers or mile markers are going to be like that. How to pass correctly. One of the things that I always tell my driving students that this is the one thing that I don't take you out driving to do. This is not a driving skill that we go out and search for somebody to pass. So most of you that drive uh, with me on a highway will not be passing somebody where we're behind them, go faster to the left of them, and then come back over to the right. I will tell you if a situation arises where it's legal and it's safe to do, we will practice it. But I'm not going to take you out, let's say, tonight at 6 o'clock, and we're going to drive around until we pass somebody. We just we just don't look for it. We wait for it to to come up. And then it's something that we approach and then we do. So basically, we're going to just talk about it here in class. So let's see if I can cue this one up. Another common maneuver is passing in the lane of oncoming traffic. It's common, but it's not always safe and must be done cautiously. It becomes a danger because of the judgment factors that we don't judge distance very well. The problem is twofold. It's hard to tell how long it's going to take to accelerate to get past the car we're trying to pass. And it's hard to tell how close the car is in the oncoming lane and how fast that car is traveling towards you. It's risky business because drivers have a hard time judging that dynamic movement. If you do plan to pass, keep this in mind. An oncoming car or truck 
does not seem to be traveling as fast as it really is. Here's a good rule of thumb. If an oncoming car is far enough away that it does not seem to be moving at all, then it is generally far enough away for you to safely make your pass. But if you can see that oncoming car is moving, then it's a different story. If you go out there to look and you see that car looks like it's moving towards you, you better tuck back in again because you're probably too close. There are other times when it is not safe to pass. If your view is blocked by either a hill or a curve, don't pass. Assume there is an oncoming car or truck just out of sight. Passing requires extreme caution because of the threat of having a head-on collision. When you talk about having a head-on collision, you're talking about doubling and tripling the forces, and maybe the forces even quadruple, depends on your speed and the nature of the car coming towards you. Also, avoid passing at intersections. This includes intersecting roads, railroad crossings, even entrances to shopping centers. If you are on a two-lane road, pass only on the left. It is dangerous and usually illegal to pass on the right. The exception is when a car ahead of you signals to make a left turn. If the car in front of you is stopped to make a left-hand turn, never pass to his left. Instead, you may pass to his right on the shoulder. In any event, experts urge drivers to not take passing lightly. It's a common driving task that requires utmost caution. This is Jim Angelo. Whoop, you took me out of it. Another common maneuver is passing in the lane of oncoming traffic. It's okay, let's talk about passing. The car in front of you has to be going five miles below the posted speed limit, okay? You can't pass somebody that's going the speed limit legally or above the speed limit, uh, but it happens all the time. Technically, they're going slower, so the minimum below the speed limit would be five. Now, when you pass somebody, the way it's written, you're not supposed to go over the speed limit. But as I told you, they're going to give you a little bit of leeway, so if you're going... If they're going 50 and you're going 57, 58 to go by them, that's going to probably be okay when you get back into your original lane. But they've got to be going pretty slow for you to go by them. They, they can go slower on the highway legally. Once they go too slow, then you could get a ticket for going too slow, just like you can get a ticket for going too fast. So first of all, the person in front of you is going too slow. You always check your rearview mirror first. Always rear view mirror first, then your left side mirror, then you do a shoulder check, then you use your signal, but only after you've made your mirror checks, okay? Because you want to make sure that nobody's passing you, okay? There are always going to be people out on the road that are going to go a lot faster, a lot faster than uh, the prevailing traffic flow. So you want to make all your checks, then you're moving out, you're going 5 to 10 miles faster than the car that you're passing because you want to get by them as quickly as possible. Now this is what I want you to write down to remember for the final. Once you see their headlights, both headlights, so the grill of their vehicle in your rear view mirror, then you put your right signal and then you move back. And you should always try to pass people on the left. People are more apt to use their left side mirror more than they do the right side mirror. So if you pass somebody on the right um, and they don't know that you're there, there's a chance that they could make a lane change to get ready for an exit that's coming up, and they just don't see you. Then uh, Most people don't use right side mirrors as much as they should. So if you're going to pass, try to do it on the left. Is it legal to pass people on the right? Absolutely. But you've got to make sure that they do see you. And at night, what they ask you to do in some states is that when you pass somebody on a highway going the same direction, is to flash your lights. Because when you flash your lights, what's your first reaction? To check your rear view mirror. So now you know that they're looking at you. Now during the day, when they don't see the headlights flashing, I would beat my horn. Just one beat, maybe two, but just a quick one. Don't do anything that's too long because then they're going to think you're angry that they're going too slow. Special features 
um, and this isn't in the manual, and I wish that they would include this, because this is going to be helpful drive it, uh, driving in bad weather. So write this down. The reflectors that you find on a highway match the color of the line that's next to you. So the color of the reflector to the right of you will be white, because that's where the white edge line, we call that the fog line. The line to the left of you is yellow, so the reflectors will be yellow. Now this is where most people mess up. Once you get close to a bridge or a guardrail, there are two reflectors, one at the beginning, one at the end. What are the colors? Think about it. What are the colors of the reflectors at the beginning of a bridge or a, a guardrail and at the end? The color at the beginning is red. The color is green at the end. Okay, now why do we have reflectors on guardrails? Because at night, especially in fog or heavy snow, if you have to pull over the side of the road, let's say you had a flat tire, and you're going to put your car over on the edge of the road, you don't want to hit something that's immovable. So anything that's immovable, they have to let you know that's the beginning of it and then the end. Because in driving, what's the opposite of red? It's the opposite of stop. Go. So that's where you get the, the red and the green. Rumble strips will alert you to your position on the road, and also if you're not paying attention, it will say you're drifting, you're, you're leaving your lane. And we have rumble strips more to the right than we do to the left. But on some roadways, right where the dotted white line is that's separating traffic flow, you may have grooves or rumble strips. So that's telling you you're leaving your lane to the left. But the, the common problem that we have with drivers is that the minute they hit a rumble strip is that they turn the wheel too much to get back onto the road. Remember when we talked about running off the edge of the pavement, you're just turning the wheel too much? Well, this is going to happen on the highway. Don't overreact because look how close these cars are. Okay, They're so close that if you turn the wheel too quickly, you're going to shoot right over. And then Easy Pass allows drivers to go through tolls without stopping. Now, the one thing that, and we're going to talk more about Easy Pass, but try to go the speed limit that they're recommending. Okay, we do have Easy Pass high speed lanes now. But uh, the ones that are very tight with a booth, you want to make sure that you're going pretty close to the speed limit. So there are mile markers that we talked about. There's full service, so there's where there'll be an attendant taking money. But by the way, you can't use that lane right now. Notice the red X. And then you have your easy pass with the green arrow telling you where you can go. And that's what a rumble strip would, would look like. So that's going to make your car shake. So hopefully you're not falling asleep behind the wheel. So there are easy pass cameras on the roadway. This was taken from an article from 2014. Um, I want you to kind of look at the uh, third paragraph. Um, the cameras are for violation enforcement, the cameras are triggered for each vehicle and only take a photo of the license plate area. Okay, once the system reads the valid transponder that the vehicle has, and that's up near your rear view mirror, it triggers that you can go through legally and the image is deleted. But if it has no transponder, then it's going to take a picture and send a bill to that registration address. Remember we talked about registration in your glove compartment? So they're going to run the plate, find out who lives at that house, and they're going to send a ticket. And notice at the very bottom here it says, however, the system is capable of storing pictures of vehicles that use the lanes without an easy pass transponder. And now what happens in states, if, if, if you don't have a transponder, they're going to still mail you your your fee. All right. And this kind of basically goes through how different states are handling it now. Uh, California, Washington, high occupancy lanes. We talked about the HOV lanes. Um, looks at Maryland, uh, Maryland's going to double tolls. This is a big revenue for, for states. And they are going to um, increase 
probably um, the fee on a regular basis because w our roads are in disrepair. So don't think that you know 75 cents or dollar is going to be what you pay all the time. And really, an easy pass is like a debit card. So once your car goes through, your account gets deducted the the amount. But you got to make sure that you have enough in that um, account. And I'm sure your parents, you know, have explained it to you. But I want to make sure that you understood. And don't feel bad if you do go through. Like I said, they're going to send you your your fee in the in the mail. It gets expensive. See, by paying by mail, uh, it's an extra dollar sixty. Whereas if you had um, an easy pass going through, it's three dollars. Now the other thing I should probably mention, and you've you've probably encountered this at some point, is that you go on like the Mass Turnpike, and you go through a toll booth, and they give you a cardboard ticket. Once they give you that ticket, you can travel as far as you want on that roadway. But once you leave, whatever exit you take is going to have a price associated with how far that you went. So make sure you understand that don't go through without taking a ticket. And if you don't take a ticket and you try to get off the mass pike, you're going to be charged the very highest amount that's on that ticket. All right? So don't lose it. Don't or don't forget to take it. All right? Cuz a lot of people will try to go through kind of nice and slow and reach out and grab it and it kind of slips through their finger and uh, then they're on the highway now without a ticket to get off so and it doesn't cost a whole lot like maybe eight nine dollars but it's still a mistake that you don't a mistake you don't want to make so to get on to the highway you should basically know which direction you want to go north south east or west so know your ramp Keep your speed while looking for, and I want you to write this down in your notes, a hole in traffic. We talked about a gap and a hole. Remember, a hole is bigger than a gap. A gap is going to probably be your following distance, three to four seconds. We want something slightly bigger than that. Now, once you're halfway on the ramp, going towards the yield sign, just about before you get to the yield sign, you should be checking your rear view mirror, and your side view mirror to see where traffic is. I would not be looking over my shoulder at the yield sign. You still have a good 150, 200 feet at the end of the ramp before you have to merge out. Too many people slow down when they look over their shoulder. You want to be looking in your mirrors and see that hole and then make your decision. So with the decision, do I pick up speed? Do I maintain speed? Or do I slow down? So looking in your mirrors are going to determine your course of action. I would recommend getting as up to highway speed as quickly as possible. And then on this third point, make sure you write this down. Traffic will allow room for you if you're going their speed. So don't slow down or stop unless you absolutely necessarily have to do it. The thing you need to remember, getting on a highway, nobody wants a car that's going slower than them to come out in front of them. So by you going their speed or slightly faster than their speed, they're going to probably back off on their accelerator a little bit and allow you to come in. But if you're checking your mirrors and you may have somebody that's saying, oh, not today, you're not getting in front of me, and then the person behind them says the same thing, you're not getting behind me, then you're going to have to slow down, find another hole in traffic, and then come out. So always leave yourself a little bit of room. Try not to stop. Does it happen? It does. It does happen at times where you're going to have to stop at the end. But it's a, a small percentage of the people that have to stop at the end of the ramp. Because then you're going from a dead stop into the flow of traffic. It gets to be really complicated. So this is my recommendation here at the bottom of the slide here. When you get up on the ramp, stop picking up that speed. Check your mirrors. Rear view, then your side view mirror. Check over your shoulder. Make sure there's nobody lingering in that blind spot. And then at the very end of the ramp, remember when you put your signal on, at the very, very end, people are more apt to back off. Because if you put your signal on too early, they're just going to disregard it. But the minute you put your directional on at the very end of the ramp, they know you're getting ready to move the wheel. 
and they're afraid that you're going to cut right out in front of them, so they're going to back off a little bit. So try to follow it in this sequence. So write that down. We'll practice that when we get out onto the road. So let's see if I can get merging to work here. It can be a high anxiety situation. You're trying to enter the freeway. Cars on the freeway are whizzing by. You're trying to keep an eye on the cars in front of you. Drivers in the cars behind you are eager for their chance to merge. It can be chaotic, and you're the one at the gate. Actually, a merge is probably one of your highest risk maneuvers that you do as a driver. Dr. Terry Klein with Eastern Kentucky University is a leading authority on driving safety and an expert on traffic rules. It's really a rather tricky maneuver because what we're asking you to do as a driver is pay attention to both the things happening in front of you, the things happening behind you, and the things happening two lanes to your left or two lanes to your right. Dr. Klein says this complicates things because as human beings, we can really pay strict attention to only one thing at a time. So as tense as it may be, you've got to learn how to merge if you want to enter a freeway. The bottom line is that you have to prepare for a merge sooner. Dr. Klein says to prepare for a merge well before you're actually ready to merge. Identify a gap between cars on the freeway where you can merge. Then continue increasing your speed until you reach the gap you selected. Dr. Klein says instead of increasing speed, drivers have a tendency to actually slow down before merging. A big mistake. You have cars behind you coming up, they're trying to enter speed themselves, so you could cause, cause a chain reaction type collision behind you as well. Dr. Klein says drivers tend to minimize the dangers in merging, and that there are actually more crashes that happen during merging than during passing. Once on the freeway, adjust your speed to keep a cushion of space around your car. The closer you get to a car around you, the more they drive you and the less you driving yourself. You become their puppet. They brake, you brake. They speed up, you speed up. They stop suddenly, you stop suddenly. Finally, once you've merged and adjusted your speed, you probably will change lanes at some point. Some quick pointers. Look around you for large enough space to move into. Use your mirrors. Turn your head to look quickly to the side before changing lanes. Then make your lane change. Changing lanes, keeping space around your car, and merging. Each is a critical task in our driving experience. So merging is by far the hardest thing to do. And if you've done some driving with your parents on the highway, I'm sure that there was probably the white knuckle experience where there was a ramp where people weren't very nice and letting you in or not. Uh, the thing I would say is that practice on the highway, merging on the highway when there's less traffic. So early mornings, especially on a Saturday or Sunday, um, or do it later, 7, 8 o'clock. Try to stay away from rush hour. It's better for you to practice when the stress level is down. A lot of times when parents drive with, with you, they do it out of convenience. Oh, we're going to the mall. We're going to school. And I understand that, okay, because it's a situation. You've got to get your driving time in. But it may put you in a situation where um, you're going to have some bad experiences. And I know a lot of people that um, have bad experiences on the highway, and then they just don't want to get back on. And you don't want that to happen. So build your confidence build your skill level and your technique and then work your way into a time frame that's going to be more challenging okay remember to let me know I'm looking at the thing if if you still can't hear me I, I think I've got my microphone on so but leaving the uh, expressway is one of the easiest things to do. So just make sure you know your ramp. Make sure um, you don't get confused. A lot of times you'll see a number and then a letter. So it'll be like 6W or 6N or 6S. You've got to remember the letter after the number is the direction you're going to be heading on the road that you're getting onto. So just because someone says take exit 6, if you've got two options, W and N, you better know which one you really want. Because I do know that it used to be that way in New Hampshire 
I think they've changed it. Um, the Durham Dover exit, it's just a single exit now. And then at the bottom of the ramp, you have a choice to go north or west. Um, but it was confusing on a state exam. And I had students that would mess up and go the wrong direction. And the licensing examiner would get all upset because now they're off route. And by the way, since we haven't driven, just to let you know a little bit about me, um, I hope you know by the way I'm teaching the class and you know trying to get your homework in to me. I'm, I'm pretty open and laid back. Um, I'm more for you for learning and have the experience than to make you feel bad that you made a mistake. So if you drive and we go the wrong direction, it really doesn't bother me as long as we don't cause problems for other people on the road. Because uh, it's a learning experience, and we learn from things like that. So highway is when we do have some mistakes that uh, people make. You should write down 500 feet for your use of directional is about the last sign before you get to the ramp. So as you're on a highway, try not to brake before your ramp. Try to wait to the last. If you look at the picture, there's a big green sign that's coming up on the right. When I had my car at that sign is probably when I would have used my signal to go to the ramp up ahead. Okay, I wouldn't wait to that second one that's coming up because that may be too close to where you're really getting off. And then know at the bottom of the ramp which way you want to go. Do you want to go north? Do you want to go south, east, west? So make sure that you position your car in the direction that you want to go at the very end. And the thing to remember, if you're turning left at the bottom of a ramp, it will always, always, always be a stop sign. If you go to the end of the ramp and you want to go right, Sometimes it's a yield sign, sometimes it's a stop sign. So you've got to say, if it's a yield sign, I better slow down to look to the left to make sure that I'm not going to cut somebody off. Just don't think you've got a yield sign and you're going to be able to just kind of fly right in with the flow of traffic. It's just not going to work. You're going to hear horns, people are going to flip you off. It's not going to be a good experience. Because a lot of people think yield means just go slowly and just keep going. It's not. You've got to check first to see if there's a, a place for you to to join traffic. Tips of survival, okay? Very easy once you get comfortable driving on the highway to let your guard down. So always be alert. Know that you're going at a very high rate of speed and any mistake that you make, it could be fatal. It really could be. Allow plenty of room when passing. Try not to squeeze into small openings. So if you have any doubt about passing, you probably shouldn't do it. We know our following distance, three to four seconds, we want to be back. We don't want to be too close. Use your turn signals always, but there's nobody on the road. You're building a habit, okay? You should always do what is right, okay? So turn signals is doing something that's right. Try not to go too fast, so keep a steady speed. A lot of people ask me, wonder if everybody's speeding, should I speed? Well, if you look at the picture right here, we have four lanes. There should be a lane that you can get in and go pretty close to the speed limit. Now, if you get caught up in traffic and they're all going, let's say, 65 and a 55, will you get pulled over? Probably not. Could you get pulled over? Sure, because you're all above the speed limit. So how do they choose which one to pull over? I don't know. Could be your, your following distance. Maybe they recognize that you're a young person. You just don't know. But you put it this way, you will never get a ticket, ever, for doing the right thing. So if you're keeping the law, keeping the speed limit, you're never going to get a speeding ticket. People that start saying, well, everybody else is doing it, so you think it's going to be okay, it's going to turn out all right, it, it, sometimes it does it. You, you, you don't want to be part of the crowd. Okay, Find a good lane to be in. Keep you good following distance and you're going to be fine. Uh, try not to stop unless like there's a car emergency, flat tire. Uh, but remember, have your cell phone. Get ready to call for help. We talked about letting people help you. Make sure that you've got your phone on if someone's walking up to your car. Make sure you've got all your emergency numbers ready so you're not fumbling through your phone, especially if you have low you know, coverage or battery power. You don't want to run out of battery power. You know, trying to go through the internet looking for AAA's number. And then the last thing here is that being tired. And I put this picture of an evening drive on the highway. It's very easy for you to get drowsy. 
and this could be at seven, eight o'clock. If you've had a long day, if you've played sports and you're going home and you still got a half hour, 40 minute drive, it's easy to lose concentration and to maybe start dozing off. So be aware of your, your feelings, your emotions when you're driving. So look for a place to maybe pull over, get off, get that caffeine we talked about. Be careful of who you're following. Here's a uh, person that was following someone that was bringing a mattress. And the mattress snapped off the top of the car, and now it becomes your problem. So when you're behind someone that you feel uncomfortable, make a lane change. Okay, And you know that when a mattress comes off, everybody's going to be trying to miss it. And they may not be looking in their mirrors. They may not be using directionals. They're not going to be ready for what's happening. Um, okay, following distance. These videos are not being helpful today. Timing is everything. And when you're on the highway, every second counts. We usually think of stopping in terms of space, but what really matters is time. It takes about one and a half seconds to notice a potential risk in front of you, and another one and a half seconds to react, hit the brakes, and slow down. So you wanna give yourself at least three seconds between the car in front of you and your vehicle. To measure, wait for the car ahead of you to pass a set object. Tree, road sign, light pole, any clear marker will do. After it passes, start counting. 1001, 1002, 1003. If you reach that same object before you reach three, you're too close. Of course, this three second baseline is right for a car in normal driving conditions. Driving in bad weather, add one more second. Driving an SUV, add another second. If you're driving a commercial vehicle, it's gotta be at least six seconds. So don't forget the three second rule. And don't forget to share the safety with your friends and family. So following distance is really probably the, the top of the list besides keeping speed. So you do those two things and you're not going to have much of a problem. Uh, let's talk about, we're going to talk more about this next week. It's called a no zone. And that's the area. It's a blind spot next to a tractor trailer. But what no zone means is do not travel in that blind spot. So when you're traveling in the blind spot, they call it a no zone. You shouldn't be there. So try to pass through it. There are hundreds of thousands of truck accidents every year. Driving a vehicle this size, that's a tough job. Imagine trying to stop 80,000 pounds going 55 miles an hour. That tempting space, trucks leave in front of them, well, it's there because they need it. When you cut in front of a truck, you're taking that buffer room away, which leaves them no space to stop, which is a really bad idea. Driving too closely behind a truck isn't safe either. A tractor trailer blocks a huge part of your view, making it hard to see what's up ahead. If they have to stop, your only warning is their brake lights. And sometimes that's just not enough. So always allow room for the truck zone and give yourself a few extra seconds of space in front of or behind them. Remember the truck zone when you're on the road. And don't forget to share the safety with your friends and family. So another thing that we have to take in consideration is how much should we rely on the special features that we have built into these cars now, nowadays. So this is going to show you a lane departure and blind spot monitoring. So travelers provided uh, these little short commercials. One day, cars may be able to drive themselves, and hopefully we'll all be safer for it. But not yet. While there are great new technologies available, it's up to us humans to use them safely. Today, we're talking about three in particular, blind spot monitoring, lane departure warning, and smart cruise control. Smart cruise control and blind spot monitoring use sensors to help you detect and avoid other vehicles, almost like having an extra set of eyes on the road. Lane departure warning uses cameras to actually read the lines of the road and alert you if you're drifting out of your lane. With all those extra sensors and cameras, we're bound to stay safe, right? Well, not so fast. The technology is great, but it isn't perfect. For example, bad weather can hamper the signal. And some drivers may rely on the sensors too much and stop looking out for themselves. So don't over rely on this helpful technology. Always remain alert and keep your eyes on the road. After all, you're the one who's in control. For now, at least, share the safety with your friends and family. 
I think that's great that we're putting these in vehicles. Uh, it's going to be so helpful, but we don't want to be so reliant that we let our guard down. We want to use the technology, but we don't want to make it 100% what we're leaning on. It's just going to be a, a smaller percentage. Okay, so let's talk about traffic circle roundabouts. So what I want you to write down, and we were kind of talking about this at the beginning of class, a traffic circle is going to have higher speeds. A roundabout is going to be a posted speed, uh, much slower, probably around 15. It's going to probably be above 15 if it's a traffic circle. Uh, traffic circles can be wide, like the Portsmouth one, but the roundabout in Lee has designated lanes for where you want to get off. So this is what I want you to write down. If you're in the right lane approaching the Lee roundabout, you can only get off at the first or second exit. That's the only thing you can do if you're in the right lane coming into the roundabout. Those are your only two options. If you're approaching the roundabout from the left lane, you can get off at the second, the third exit, or you can make a full circle and come back from the direction that you approached it. So you have more options. Uh, every circle, every roundabout is going to have a yield, which means you're looking for an opening to blend with traffic. It's not cutting off other people. It's waiting for an opportunity to blend in with traffic. You should use your signal, okay, when you leave a circle. Don't get in and let them guess that you're getting out. If you're using your signal prior to where you're getting off, it allows people at the yield sign to know what you're doing, and then they will be able to come into the roundabout or the circle. But if you don't put your circle on, they're guessing. And that's where a lot of people have problems. Because you're at the yield sign, you go, oh, that car's going slow. I think I can go in front of it. And he's not getting off. He's still going around the circle or around the roundabout. And then that's where you hear the horn or where there's a car crash. And the other thing is it's better to approach the roundabout circle slower than the posted speed limit than to do the posted speed limit. Most people go into these situations way, way too fast. Way, way too fast. That is where there's going to be a problem. This is a picture of a European roundabout, and I just wanted to show you because it really does give a good uh, sight line of the different lanes and what your options are. So here they've got actually three ways that you can go around the, the roundabout, and this is in London. Um, so you should, as you approach a roundabout or traffic circle, you, you should know as you approach where you want to go. You don't want to get right to the yield sign and really have no idea do you want to get off at the second one, the third exit. You should know. You should know. So this is what the Lee Circle looks like. Okay. So you can see that there are two lanes coming in. And I don't know if you can see my cursor or not, because I don't think you probably can. But I, let's see, I've got a, the video that the Department of uh, Transportation, let's see if I can get that on.
Can you hear it? No. Now you can probably hear me. I noticed the green sign came out. So hopefully just kind of looking at the, the video. Let me just kind of go back because we couldn't hear it a little bit. So the signs. So at the yield sign, you basically need to know where you're going to be going. Is it the first, second exit or the second, third, fourth? And uh, basically watching traffic. So that's telling you on a highway you're getting off at the, the first exit. But on the traffic circle, there's going to be that slight bend, that bend to the arrow. So that's telling you your options, your first to second. And then if you're going to your second or third, it's going to look a little a little bit different. And the green area is where you can travel. Notice the large uh, the large vehicle that's got the cars on top. See, he stopped at the top. See, people are coming out in front of him. They shouldn't do that. So it is complicated, uh, especially when you don't know what you want to do. And, and just be careful about large trucks. It is so difficult when you get around them. That, that's the biggest thing. So just know that. Let's talk about going through a tunnel. Um, I don't know of a tunnel in New Hampshire, but I know that if you ever travel to Boston, there's going to be a situation where you're going to probably be going through a tunnel. Uh, so what I want you to write down is that if it's bright out and you've got sunglasses on, make sure you take them off before you enter in because it's going to get much more difficult to see. Always have your headlights on. Always, always. Because you want people to, to, to see you when they look in their rearview mirror. Um, when you're in the tunnel, not all tunnels just go all the way through. Some of them are going to have exits underneath. So if you know that you have to get off on an exit that's in a tunnel, make sure that you stay in the middle lane or the far right lane to prepare for getting off. You don't want to get caught over on the far left side in a tunnel uh, because then you won't be able to get off and then you're going to end up going all the way through the tunnel and then have to find your way back. Use your side mirrors more in a tunnel because at times it's going to seem almost claustrophobic and um, you don't want to lose your position in your lane in a tunnel because it's going to seem like everybody's going faster. It's going to seem like everybody's going a little bit closer. So use your mirrors, know what's coming up next to you, especially large trucks. So use your mirrors more. And then always go a little bit slower and concentrate on really trying to be centered as much as you possibly can. So I'm going to show you a clip of um, that I took going through a Boston tunnel. So notice that I'm in the middle lane. Okay. We have four lanes up to the far left, because I am going to go all the way through. But if I was going to be getting off soon, I would be to the right of the lane that I'm in right now. You see there's a ramp. That's probably taking me to the, to the airport. What is ahead of me and an A? So the A would also be the direction of yourself and the surprise. So right now, I'd be looking in my rear view mirror more, my side view mirrors. That's just going to be uh, kind of helpful. What happened? One day, cars may be able to drive themselves, and hopefully we'll all be safer for it. But not yet. While there are great new technologies available, it's up to
I will show you this. This was probably on the last slide because I knew tunnels was going to be near the end. So I think this is the last one. I just want to show you a video of somebody that's not paying attention uh, while he's approaching a tow booth. I thought this was kind of um, kind of funny. So you can see that he probably was falling asleep or distracted, didn't realize he was getting too close to the toll booth and lost his position and hit one of those what we call jersey barriers right there in the middle where he uh, got lifted up. So, well, I think that brings us to the end of what I had for my PowerPoint, but I did want to show you something with animals. So I'm going to throw a few things on here on the board. I'm going to see if I can just use this slide. So bear with me. I'm going to see if this works. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so I'll just throw it on. So this layer on top. Uh, road fatalities. It's very common for people to see animals come out into the road and then overreact, hit the brakes too hard, uh, turn the wheel too much. So uh, it says between 2005 and 2009. So this is kind of old, um, where people were killed in collisions between animals and motor vehicles. Uh, Florida, Georgia had 21, 27. Um, California, 26. Colorado, 23. We live in a state where we have a lot of wildlife, and I'm going to show you a video in a moment um, about what to do, do if you do have some of the larger animals. So my, my philosophy with animals is that if it's relatively small, um, you want to try to miss it, um, you know, break a little bit, turn the wheel, try to miss it a little bit. But if it's a larger animal, you better try to stop. I mean, it's not missing it. it it's you've got to miss it because it's going to come up on the, the hood of the vehicle, hit the windshield. It's going to be a lot worse. Um, it's This is just an article I found. And it said that probably the the biggest animal is a deer. That is the most common animal to be hit. And in New Hampshire, we I want watch you to write this down because it's going to be in the video. It's going to be bear, moose, deer, turkeys. All right, those are the, the animals that we're finding that people in New Hampshire are colliding with. And we just don't want that to happen. Because um, it's going to do damage to the car and it could injure or kill you if you go off the edge of the road. So make sure that you don't do anything that's um, too abrupt. So let's see if I can get the animal video up. There are approximately 1,500 collisions reported between wildlife and motor vehicles. On average, one to two people are killed, and over 1,300 people are injured in these collisions. The average cost for repairs to a vehicle involved in a collision with a deer, a bear, or a turkey is around $4,000. However, vehicle repair costs after hitting a moose average $23,000. There are four wild animals that can cause significant vehicle damage or personal injury. The following video focuses primarily on moose. But keep in mind, you're more likely to hit a bear, a turkey, or a deer on New Hampshire's roadways. If you want to lessen your chances of hitting a wild animal, please listen carefully to and abide by the following safe driving instructions. <laughs> Wildlife and cross the road anywhere. You need to be constantly scanning the sides of the roads. If you do see wildlife, slow down and be aware that at night your visual acuity is greatly impacted. You simply cannot see what is coming up onto the roadbed. So you need to drive slower to account for the fact that at any moment something may pop into the road. I looked in the mirror to see if I could cut in and I couldn't. I looked ahead and 10 yards from me was this big bull moose standing there. And I never had, touch, never had time to touch the brakes. My mind said moose, bang, it was that quick. The moose fell on top of my, on my roof and then crushed my roof and my head and everything in the process and broke my uh, spinal cord. You 
see that big thing standing in the road and you stop and you look and you realize you're looking at one big living moving animal an AI I mean even for me as many as I've seen around here when I see just that one stopped and looking at you that's a big animal moose are large somewhat homely but as John Sutton and Dartmouth Hitchcock calls them majestic animals they reflect our environment well moose are perfectly adapted to live in the north country their legs are four feet long um, they're almost six feet tall or better at the shoulder they weigh about a thousand pounds on average as an adult they can weigh as much as fourteen hundred pounds they have a very heavy hide and very thick hair coat they are, they are just perfectly adapted to the cold and deep snow if you hit a moose going faster than 55 miles per hour these animals are six feet tall or better at the shoulder you hit them at the leg at the height of their legs they clear the legs out from underneath them their body comes down if you are going better than 55 miles an hour your vehicle is continuing at a quite a rate of speed as the body is falling down the body hits either in your windshield or right on top of the roof and that's a thousand pounds that's coming through the windshield at you or coming down on top of the roof there's a couple things that happen to the people in the front seat. Normally the first thing they, that happens is they obviously get covered with glass because of all that um, fragmentation from the windshield uh, being destroyed. Uh, secondly, the roof tends to collapse down on top of them and because of that they usually end up with either um, head injuries, neck injuries, spinal injuries of some sort, some sort. They're covered with ticks, particularly in the earlier part of the year. Um, thousands of them. They then find themselves into the clothes and hair of the occupants of the vehicle. And they're unpleasant. They don't cause illness. They just require removal. The animal may bleed. And very often, when they're inside the vehicle, their sphincters relax. And so they defecate and let loose their bowels within the, the vehicle. The moose was on top of the vehicle. And after uh, it uh, went, got over the initial shock of being hit, it started struggling. And uh, the, uh, the moose actually kicked out one of the rear windows while it was on top of her car. And that salt that we've been using all winter long on the roads is something that moose desperately need come spring. So they will come out to the road to utilize the salt. And they'll continue to do that all through the spring, summer, and early fall months. And they're so black, you don't see them till you're right on top of it. People say, oh, you can't see a moose. You know, it's so big. But they, they blend in. Your headlights, you know, finally will pick them up. The other thing, at least especially up in, in the North Country, but it's helpful anywhere, I would say is to scan the roadway a lot when you're driving really pay attention um, to look further down the roadway then uh, I think a lot of people are kind of trained to look more directly in front of their car rather than looking at the furthest point that they can see when they're driving which would give them time to react and, and prevent a collision um, it's difficult with moose because they're just so hard to see especially at night you usually don't see them until you're right up on them when it's getting dusk to dark use your high beams you turn your headlights on, use your high beams. Obviously not at other cars coming at you. But if you're out there by yourself, flip your high beams up. Um, watch your speed. Keep it down. Leave yourself enough time so if something jumps out in front of you, hopefully you can at least slam on your brakes and either minimize the damage or and or just not get involved at all. Their eyes do reflect light, but because they're so tall, I mean, their head can be seven feet above the tarmac you're not looking that high off the roadway in order to see that eye shine and typically they may not be turning to look at you because moose because they're so large really aren't afraid of very much so they may be looking down the road they may be looking directly across the road it's hard to see them at night moose are the largest animals in the woods they are afraid of nothing Moose that don't run are moose that live 
for another day, the worst thing they can do is run from their primary predator, which is a wolf pack. So they have evolved to stand their ground, which also makes it not, not very good for them when a, a, a car is approaching. A lot of moose will stand their ground if they consider it to be a threat rather than run. And what we have to f remember is this is a factor of an animal who is not afraid of a car or a human being or a tractor trailer. Um, they have no issues with that um, and they tend to just stroll out and do whatever they want to do whenever they want to do it. And you, you don't know really when they're going to bust right out of the woods and make a run across the road. So when you are in moose country and it says watch for moose, heads up, pay attention to it. Drive 55, um, keep your high beams on whenever possible and scan, scan, scan for something coming up into the road. You're going to lose. You're, you're, you're just going to lose if you hit one. And the hard part is maybe you'll survive, but your friends won't. Her last words to her mother were, Mom, there's a moose. She was killed at the scene, but her mother was not aware of her death. She was transported to the, uh, dazed and confused, transported to the emergency department in Littleton, and I had to tell her. And the, uh, the grief of a mother is, is, is like the earth grieving its young. <laughs> Okay, uh, the thing to remember about, it's going to be a lot worse at night. By the time that you see the, the eyes, the reflection, it's going to be hard to, to stop. So that's why a slower speed at night is going to be more beneficial. And you'll notice that most roadkill on the road is more over near the white edge line, the fog line, than towards the yellow. Because by the time the animal comes out into the road, it will freeze when it sees the headlights. And your first reaction, if, if the animal is only near the white line, then I'm going to go towards the yellow line and go over it. So be very careful with oncoming traffic, making that decision of whether to hit an animal or not hit it. Because uh, you don't want to hurt a human. And I know you don't want to hit an animal, but you don't want to hurt a, a human either. So hopefully that was helpful. Um, for homework, I am going to send you a review test on what we've covered this week. So it's going to cover uh, today highway, it's going to uh, cover alcohol a little bit, and it's going to cover insurance. So I'm going to send you a link. It's like the midterm, same type of format. Just try to get it done before Monday's class. And then on Monday's class, if I see here correctly, we are talking about sharing the road with other users. So we're going to talk about tra uh, tractor trailer trucks on the highway, motorcycles, uh, pedestrians, joggers, um, the motorcycle training course, we'll talk a little bit about that. So read chapter 11, do the questions at the end of chapter 11 in responsible driving, read section 11 in the state manual, so make sure you've downloaded that. Um, and we're going to put road rage with either distracted driving or review. And the other thing that I haven't been able to cover with you is uh, driving a manual transmission. I don't know how many of you have had an opportunity, but I do like to cover it in class to talk about when to shift, the friction point, things like that. So we've got to kind of squeeze that in. But next week, it's that's the big push. So we've got a few more
topics to talk about and then just wait for the emergency order to lift and then we're on the road so we're almost there so hang in there do your work um, I hope you have a great weekend and let's just cross our fingers that we're going to hear real soon hopefully that we'll be able to get behind the wheel so thanks for hanging with me today I apologize for the lack of uh, sound on the videos and uh, hang up with my slides I've got to kind of figure this out there are a whole bunch of buttons that you don't see that I'm using it's really kind of tough but uh, I think we made it uh, hopefully the information's been helpful so we'll see you on Monday at 4 o'clock have a great weekend